Welcome to the Raised with Jesus podcast, 10 minutes every day where the life of Jesus meets yours. In this episode of the Raised with Jesus podcast, we have our Zoom audio recording from last week's Bible class on Hebrews chapter 10, looking at just one paragraph, that paragraph in Hebrews 10 we call the Great Salad Bar section of the New Testament. But maybe that's just me. Here goes. So last time, um, the first part of chapter 10, he really he really culminated in verses 11 through 14 um, is basically basically the summary of everything that he had said so far. Um, verses 11, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14 reads like this. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And with that, that little paragraph, (laughs) he basically summarizes um, what the Jewish worship life had had become by this time, and um, as compared with the reality of what Jesus had done. And the entire purpose of the Old Testament Jewish worship life was supposed to be foreshadowing, was supposed to point ahead and, and give a foreshadowing of, um, of the Messiah that they were supposed to be watching for, that the priest was, you know, as they go through the great day of atonement, as they go through these, these different ritual sacrifices, they were, were supposed to be a picture of the coming Messiah. And if they just kept clinging to those sacrifices, then they totally missed the point. Um, because here in verses 11, verse 11, he says, you know, day after day, <laughs> every priest stands and does this. And he does it again and again, because these sacrifices aren't able to take away sin. If they were able to take away sin, then, um, then he'd only have to do it once. And that's the contrast that verse 12 this priest, Jesus Christ, has offered for all time this one sacrifice for sins once and for all. Then he sat down because his work is complete. Um, he, he's no longer, there's kind of that contrast in verses 11 and 12 between the priest standing and performing his duties and the priest sitting and being seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, because his duties are done and complete. Is verse 14. By this by his one sacrifice, he, made, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy, um, or he has he has brought them to their brought them to their goal. I think is kind of the underlying underlying word here. Yeah, um, that he has brought them to their goal of of being declared not guilty in God's eyes. And that paragraph really is the is probably the the culminating summary. And then verses fifteen through um, through eighteen is kind of the epilogue. He's like, well, if you, in case you had missed this or had any doubt about this, um, God spoke about it and God said it would be coming, that there would be a time when sin would be forgiven and where sin has been forgiven, um, there's no longer any sacrifice for sin because their sin has been forgotten. So that's where we left off last time. And verse 18 closes out the first half of the book of Hebrews. You know, we're, we're 10 and a half, well, yeah, nine and a half chapters in, well, 10 and a half chapters in uh, to the book of Hebrews. And finally, we get to part two, um, which is as a result of all this, the fact that Jesus has done everything, the fact that this is full and complete. Um, how are then are we supposed to live? And verses or chapter ten, really through uh, chapter fourteen, is going to is going to be you know a, a number of a lot of different applications. Because this is the case, then let us hold on to everything that we have. Um, let us. That's basically the rest of chapter ten. Let us keep on doing these these things. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. We'll have that in verse twenty three. Um, chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11 is that chapter called the, the heroes of faith chapter. Um, and it's, it's seven groups of seven (laughs) talking about, um, different, different people at different times throughout Christian history and, and how they suffered and, and how they persevered and how they came to, um, to see in, in all fullness, all the blessings that God had promised, and they were now fully possessing them. Um, chapter 12 is going to deal with the question of suffering. The question of, you know, if, if I'm a Christian and, 
and it is true that Jesus has done everything for me, then why do I suffer? And chapter 12 um, basically closes out the book. Chapter 13 is just kind of a potpourri of, um, you know, seven or eight different different things that he didn't have space for in the rest of the letter. He's like, by the way, don't forget this and don't forget that. Um, so picking it up in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished, who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God." Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the, faith of, in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who, are, who believe and are saved. Excuse me. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the part that kind of wraps us up here, um, in the rest of chapter 10 and gets us into the, the intense application for the rest of the book. Um, and it all, it all hinges, you know, back in verse 18, where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. And he starts out in the exact same way as he's done throughout the entire rest of the book, uh, with his therefore. Because what he's going to be getting into in verses 19, especially 19 through 25, um, these are all statements of law. All of these, you know, the part that I jokingly called the, the, the salad bar section of God's word, um, because there's all, all this lettuce all over the place. Um, I'm going to use that joke until it gets really, really old. <laughs> It helps people remember it, I think, or maybe not. Um, if you're looking at it, we'll, we'll just highlight some of those things first before we get back to that, therefore, in verse 19. Um, so beginning in verse 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. Actually, we'll highlight that whole section. Let us draw near to God, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Verse 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And all of those statements, 22 through 25, we've got one, two, three, four, five of them in four verses. Um, all of those statements are statements of law. And that's those statements of law, although they're good because God's law is still good and God's law is always good um, because God's law is perfect. Although it's good for the Christian, what matters more isn't um, what the law is, but the reason why. And if there, even if you obey the law perfectly, but you don't have the correct reason behind it, then it's just as if you hadn't obeyed it in the first place. And so that's the, that's the therefore that we have in verse 19. 
Um, therefore, you know, since sin has been forgiven and there's no longer any sacrifice for sin, um, and he's still drawing on that Old Testament imagery of, of sacrifice of this, this sin being placed on the goat and taken away of, of the sin being completely obliterated and completely forgotten and completely washed away by the blood of that lamb. And he's building on that idea. And, and he says, you know, we have this confidence to enter the most holy place. Um, not just, not just the, the, holy, the most holy place like where one priest, the high priest, on one day a year would enter. But we, we Christians, have um, confidence <laughs> to enter the most holy place. Um, when he says the most holy place, the, the idea there is, um, you know, here's the absolute presence of God, that you are, as a Christian, you're standing in his presence um, today and always. That's, that's kind of the way that Paul wrote back in Ephesians chapter one, that we have been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms and, um, and, and that we are, um, and that we're continually in his presence today and always. And I think we've touched on that idea, you know, once or twice before that, um, that as a Christian, you you're in the presence of God now and you have eternal life now as something that will, you will never be separated from the Lord. And you think of this, this contrast, the, the high priest could only enter that most holy place by the blood of bulls and goats. Um, he would, he would offer a bull for his own sin and, uh, and then offer a goat for the sin of the people. He would have to go through the ceremonial washing and follow all of the strict ceremonial uh, regulations and rules um, even in the days and weeks leading up to that entry into the most holy place. Um, but he says, we have confidence to enter this most holy place. And he's not talking about the little area, but the, but the very presence of God. And the reason we have this confidence um, is, is by the blood of Jesus. And then he, in verse 20, he kind of has this, ap- this uh, appositional phrase, this appositive um, you know, in this by a new living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. Verse 20 in its entirety, um, you could, if you see the, the comma at the end of verse 19 and the comma at the end of verse 20, those are like handles. You could just pick up the whole verse and, and lift it out of there or leave, put, it, put it back in there. Um, because what he's really doing with verse 20 is, is providing another way of describing what he just said in verse 19 that we enter the most holy place by, by the blood of Jesus, the perfect lamb of God, and that this entry into the most holy place is, um, is different, that it is, it is new, first of all, and that it is, it is a living way, um, exactly as Jesus said when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I think, you know, that's, that's definitely a parallel statement to what he's talking about here, that there is this new way where he enters into heaven or where we enter into the, um, in, into the presence of God and that there's this living and ongoing way because Jesus lives, which is the contrast, another contrast, I suppose, between Jesus and those sacrifices where, yes, Jesus actually was sacrificed, but he was raised from the dead. And so he lives. Um, he lives triumphant from the grave. He lives eternally to save. Um, he lives for us to come in, to the presence of God with confidence, verse 19. Um, and he's like, oh, by the way, just in case you missed it, we're talking about the, the body of Jesus. Um, in verse 19 and verse 20, um, he, he makes a specific reference to the, to the blood of Jesus and to, um, and to the, the, the flesh of Jesus. Um, verse 19 and 20, he's not talking about uh, Holy Communion there. Um, even the, the word that he uses here for body is, is a different word. It's the word that Jesus uses in John chapter 6 for flesh. Um, sarks, you know, and where that comes into our English language, I guess, is the word sarcastic. Is, um, it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's hilarious humor, but at the same time, it's kind of cutting. So if you're using sarcasm for humor, um, it, it it's a humor that cuts the flesh, which is the idea here. And so when we, even when we use sarcasm, we, at the same time, we recognize, well, I need to be careful because this is, this is humor that cuts the sarks, the flesh. That's what he says here in verse, in verse 20. Um, just a second. <clears throat> 
There we go. Um, so that's, you know, verse 20, that we have this confidence and that there, that this way into the most holy place is, it's new. That is, it's different from all of those other sacrifices. It's without parallel in all of those other sacrifices. And it is this living way, um, that Jesus is living now and he will continue to be the way into the most holy place. And, um, and he kind of ties up that idea of the comparison um, in, here in verses 20 and 21, when he talks about um, he, this living way open to us through the curtain. And we have a great high priest over the house of God. And, and that's really the last little, last little tidbits of comparison with the Old Testament worship life that we're going to have really in the book of Hebrews. Um, there's probably a couple other, actually there's, there's one more um, that's going to be coming in right here. But for the most part, he's, he's already completed and, and finished out all the ideas that he had brought up previously about, about the great high priest, about the intercessor, about the sacrifices, um, that sort of a thing. And he's going strong more strongly i guess into um into the application that is based entirely on the work of jesus rather than this continual comparison and because yeah that's that's really characteristic of the second half of the book of hebrews that he's done with the comparison and he's like all right now since you have seen that jesus is the greater high priest and everything um, so the part in yellow, the most holy place, and through the curtain, we have a great high priest, and then that last part washed with pure water. Um, and that, that's just, yeah, that, like I said, that's just tying up the rest of the comparison um, that we have this great high priest. Um, again, that's another, that's another present active, you know, present active indicative or present statement, that this is a statement of fact, that this is our great high priest even right now. Um, so you see in verse 19, we have confidence through the curtain is where we're going into the very presence of God. Uh, we have confidence through this new and living way and in that we continue to have this great high priest over the house of God. Um, and on the basis of all that, He's like, in case he missed it, verse 19, therefore, since this is the case, then we get to verse 22 through 25 and all the, the lettuce encouragements. Um, and so you notice that he's very careful to, to make sure that these encouragements are set in a gospel context, um, that he's not... He's not, he's not just tossing out, you know, law bombs um, <laughs> to say, hey, you got to be doing this and you should be doing that. Um, or, you know, draw near to God and hold unswervingly um, or else. He says, no, <laughs> your Lord has, has opened this way for you to come into his presence um, and to come into this presence as a new and holy and joyful thing anytime and every time that you have opportunity. Um, he, he totally sets the context as thinking about the blessings and the benefits that Jesus has won for us before he gets into the statement of, of law in verses 22 through 25, so that um, all these statements of law can be seen as what we call the third use of the law, um, the use of the law as a guide or a rule. Perhaps that's the terminology you, you used if you used the old uh, Brown Gausiewicz catechism when you were younger. Um, the law is a, as a guide for thankful Christian living is, is kind of the way that I like to describe it because that, that really, you know, fills out the rest of the idea that the law isn't just there as a guide for how to live your life, but the law is there as a guide for saying thank you to God. And that's even, even in the way that Luther has the, the Ten Commandments and their explanations um, phrased in, in his catechism um, when it gets to that idea of what does this mean? And all the, all the explanations start with, we should fear and love God. Um, except for the first, we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. But it's like the second through the 10th, we should fear and love God so that we do not do this one thing and we do do this other thing. Um, he really phrases those 10 commandments as the third use of the law. The law is a guide for thankful Christian living. That's what we have here in verses 22 through 25. And the reason that's so important isn't just some, some metaphysical or mental exercise um, or some philosophy, but the, 
the gospel providing the reason and the motivation and the purpose for the law is entirely what sets Christianity apart from anything and everything else. Um, that your obedience to God does, doesn't add a single thing to our salvation, um, but your obedience to God is a result of God's commitment to you first. And, and so he says, verse 22, <clears throat> we'll take, um, we'll take these, we'll take these one by one, I suppose. Uh, verse 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. A um, couple of things here. And, and if there are any questions, just feel free to uh, feel free to speak up um, or, or text me. <laughs> Um, so verse 22, let us draw near to God um, with a sincere heart. Um, this idea of sincerity is going to be what he, he keys off on. Um, and how, how is it that our hearts can be sincere? This idea of, of sincere um, is the idea of, of totally of true, truthful. Um, that's, that's kind of the idea lingering in the background that there's, that there's nothing to hide. Um, and it kind of reminds you of um, in the gospel of John, when John is saying that Jesus didn't know, didn't need to ask what was in a man's heart. He knew it was in a man's heart um, because Jesus was true. <laughs> or um, we have, I think it's in maybe first John or first, first Peter. <laughs> Shoot. I'd have to get a little rusty here um, where he talks about, we have come to the one who is true and he is trustworthy. Um, or even, even there in the end of Revelation, it comes up a number of times with all these different names for Jesus, the one who is true, the one who is trustworthy, the first and the last. Um, that idea of sincerity is like, you know, I've you might say to yourself, <laughs> Pastor Higgin, that sounds terrifying. Um, it does, because we are because we are sinful human beings. But he goes on to say. You know, we draw near to God um, without fear, but we draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith um, that, that, there's, that, there's no, that there's really no doubt <laughs> that God is going to be faithful to what he says. This full assurance of faith isn't, isn't full assurance of my faithfulness that I have. I know I can be confident before God because I've, I've tried really hard and I've, uh, I've kicked the habit or I've changed my schedule or I've really held up my side of the bargain or anything like that. Um, this full assurance of faith is based on what he says here in the rest of the verse. Um, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Um, he will sprinkle to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Actually, I'll just change that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, he's still, he's still acting within the the picture of approaching God at the temple. And he's still coming out of that idea that we had earlier in chapter 10 and really the entire book of Hebrews. And he's, and so a lot of this terminology and a lot of the illustrations that he uses are going to be pulling off of what he had said previously. Um, having had, having a heart sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Um, and the idea there is that we are participants in a better covenant, um, that participants in that first covenant had their bodies sprinkled with the blood of the covenant, um, that they collected the blood in basins, they sprinkled everything in the altar area, they sprinkled the Ark of the Covenant, and they sprinkled the people. Um, after the people said, we will do this, we agree. And they became participants in that covenant through the sprinkling of the blood. And he says, well, this, since we are participants in a better covenant, um, we have our hearts sprinkled, um, that our hearts have been sprinkled for what purpose? To cleanse us from a guilty conscience, um, that our sincerity, our sincere hearts um, are sincere because we've been cleansed from a guilty conscience, that even if your conscience should accuse you um, and say, oh, how can, how can you come into the most holy place? Or even how can you come into church on Sunday? You know, I hear that, you know, probably at least once or twice a year. Oh, pastor, 
Pastor Hagen, you don't want me in your church because if I do, the whole place will fall down around me. <laughs> and it's like, no, you don't get it <laughs> because you don't, your, your presence in God's house isn't dependent on what you've done or left undone. Your presence is on based on what Jesus has done. And so your heart um, in faith, that your heart has been sprinkled to cleanse you from that guilty conscience. Um, not just from the actual guilt that stood opposed to us, but even from those feelings of guilt. Um, you think of, I think we had that discussion about actual guilt versus guilt feelings and that, um, that our actual guilt was removed through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is your guarantee that God has removed your sin um, and that he has counted you not guilty. But a Christian might still deal with feelings of guilt um, where a Christian might feel, well, and we, and in our English language, we don't really draw a distinction between the two. Like, oh, I feel guilty today. Well, <laughs> you're not guilty and your, your feelings are betraying you um, because Jesus has risen from the dead and he has actually taken away your sin. He has done away with the actual guilt. And, um, and so your, your feelings of guilt are improper and poorly placed. And you might think of um, that verse from In Christ Alone, uh, I think the last verse, no, no fear in, or no fear in death, no, no, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me, and I think that's one of the reasons that um, that him speaks so powerfully. But even even in the the way that is phrased, I think I have the the words here. I'll have to um, let's see, CWS. That is kind of interesting. Um, that we should probably look at ever so briefly. I think it's 752. Um, I'll bring it up here and then we'll, I wish we had, oh, RTF, sorry about that. Because even in, in that, the wording of in Christ alone, we've got this, this wording that really talks about the power of Christ in me rather than, um, here we are, new share, We'll go to, there we go. Um, in Christ alone, so hymn 752, and a beautiful hymn. And, but I think we also need to be cognizant of, of even the shortfallings of, of some of these things. Um, you know, verse, verse one, okay, cool. Um, in Christ alone, my hope is found, my light, my strength, my song. Um, verse four is where, especially this very first line is where the writer to the Hebrews um, disagrees with Keith and Kristen Getty and Stuart Townen in the way they wrote this verse four is no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. And even, even down to that, that last phrase um, and, and it can be understood properly, which is why, which is why it wasn't changed and why it's in our hymnal, because this is, this is talking about the application of Christ's forgiveness in my life, that I, I have nothing to be, feel guilty about. I have nothing to fear in death. And this is where I see the power of Christ in my life. But the other way that it could be understood and and I, it's a complete and utter possibility based on what I know of their, their theology is that it's kind of turned around that I have no guilt in this life and no fear in death because Christ is as a result of Christ working through me. And when people talk about Christ in me or Christ working through me, that is a sanctification topic. That's talking about um, growth in faith. That's talking about growth in godly living, sanctification, um, basically our lives for God, how we are set apart as holy and how we live our lives as holy lives for our God. Um, and that is a totally separate thing from justification, which is Jesus for us. And, and, that's, and that's why that discussion um, in verses 19 through 25, when we talk about the therefore in verses 19 through 25, um, that he really, the writer to the Hebrews really nails down that, you know, in two or three verses, he says, you know what, um, your life is completely and utterly changed because of all that Jesus has done for you. Um, and so, you know, how would I, how would I change these 
how would I change these words if somebody gave me a pen and said, change it? Um, I have to really work at it because they are marvelous poetry, but they don't, they aren't as, um, there's some potential for unclarity there that shouldn't be there because we're not, our focus isn't so much about the power of Christ in me, especially when we're talking about our guilt and our fear. Um, then our focus should be on Christ for me that Jesus rose from the dead for me, and that this is a fact of faith and a fact of history that brings absolute comfort to me at every stage of life and at every time and every place. Um, that the fact that I have no guilt in life or no fear in death, um, yeah, it's, it's a result of those facts. It's not a result of the ongoing work of Christ in me or Christ through me which is, it's, it's a, it sounds like a fairly minor distinction, especially if you've never discussed that before in a Bible class. Um, and this is, this is only a cursory overview. <laughs> My apologies. Um, but it's actually a fairly major inversion of, of law and gospel or an importation of you know, bringing, bringing the law into the gospel or bringing gospel into law um, or really putting on me in my life now, what Jesus already accomplished in his life. That was our free for nothing trashing of the hymnal tonight. <laughs> uh, hopefully it wasn't an absolute trash. I still like that hymn. Um, I even wrote a, uh, and we, we've used this a couple of times at, at Resurrection, a, a, another verse that focuses particularly on the means of grace um, where Jesus distributes his, his forgiveness in word and in sacrament. Um, and it uses the same tune, but I can't call it a fifth verse to that hymn because the Gettys don't like that. So it uses the same tune. We usually begin with in Christ alone and then close with that other, um, I think call it Christ is present, something like that. Anyway, all of that to say that when he talks about this in verses 19 and 20 and 21, that all of these things Jesus has done for us have an actual result. Verse 22, he gets to our lives of sanctification. And verse, all the ones in green, the statements in green, let us draw near to God, hold us certainly, let us consider, not give up meeting together, let us encourage. Um, those are statements of, of law. And they are spoken as a, think, a guide to thankful Christian living. And, and so, you know, as even when he says these things, he's got a statement of law and then he, he fills it out with gospel. Um, and he does that again here in, in verse 22, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. In other words, that you are a participant in this new covenant through the blood of Jesus and having our bodies washed with pure water. Um, that phrase washed with pure water, um, it's one of two things, and some might, or, you know, there's kind of three options here. Um, option A, that he's still drawing on this, this image of us entering the most holy place in verse, from verse 19 and 20. Um, and one of the things that the priest would do before entering the most holy place was have a ritual bath where he would be, you know, have clean water and just he would have a bath and then he would get dressed in his priestly garments, and then he would come out to the people to, uh, to continue the worship service. And that was really the very first part of the worship service where he would disappear and, and go through this ritual bathing. And then he would be dressed in the garments of the high priest. And then he, they would get into the day. <laughs> Could you imagine that? It's like the first 10 or 15 minutes of, of worship on the, the greatest and, you know, the most, most people in, in the temple, like in the entire year. And it's like, okay, uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. And then the priest goes to have a bath and <laughs> he comes back, you know, 10, 15 minutes later. And then, but just the, the imagery of that, that he has been washed and he has presents, presents himself as one holy and, and calling, called to this specific duty or task. And he now carries it out as one who is clean in a very real way. So I think that's the first option and probably the best option. Um, kind of the second option or the secondary option is um, talking about baptism. Um, having our bodies washed with pure with pure water, and I kind of lean away from identifying verse twenty two as baptism um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, he doesn't 
there's this there's this connection oops sorry there's this there's this connection with our bodies washed with with clean water or pure water um and he doesn't he doesn't go on to talk about any of the spiritual benefits of of baptism here and he doesn't talk about a connection you know washing with the water in the word washing by the spirit um or any of those other phrasings that we use in throughout most of the rest of the new testament when we're talking about baptism um so I guess that would be option number two and a somewhat distant second place. Option number three would be kind of saying, well, okay, it's both, <laughs> which is, which is kind of, kind of a cop out. Um, but maybe option number three would also be, have the idea that, that we as Christians um, are this now, this holy priesthood as people who, you know, when Jesus, when Jesus, or when John started to go baptizing and when Jesus was baptizing during his ministry, baptism wasn't something that was unknown. Um, they went through ritual washings to make themselves to be made clean. That was part of the Levitical law. And even, even yeah, in their Jewish worship life, the, the high priest would go and have a bath um, for, for in the first few minutes of the great day of atonement worship day. Um, and so this is this is a motif or an idea that God has certainly used throughout history, um, but I don't I don't really see baptism here, um, especially when we've got the contrast earlier in the verse when He says, "Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water." Um, the in the yellow. All the way back to verse 19, the most holy place, the curtain, the great high priest sprinkled to cleanse and wash with pure water. Those all look to me like he's still um, finishing out the idea of Old Testament worship activities and actions. And that's kind of, I think that's what we have here. Um, if somebody said, well, pastor, I think it's really talking about baptism. Um, you know, we, we could talk about that. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold anybody's feet to the fire too, too poorly about that or too much about that. But my question would be, what would be the application or the specific reason for phrasing it the way he does? Um, referring to having our, that our hearts have been already sprinkled to cleanse us um, and our bodies washed with pure water. Um, this washing with pure water is, is kind of pictured as, as a physical act. Um, and then the sprinkling of the hearts kind of pictured as this emotional and spiritual act um, because we are now set free from the guilty conscience. Anyway, um, I think that's, that's probably enough on verse 22. And, and it's kind of a still, still application of entering the most holy place, place, drawing near to God. Verse 22, let us draw near to God. Verse 23, um, the next part of the beautiful salad bar. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Um, and he continues, as he did before, um, with the reason why. With a gospel-founded, gospel basis, why? We should hold unswervingly. Um, why? Because God is faithful. Um, and by this time, you know, ch 10 chapters into the book of Hebrews, you're not, you're not ignorant to all that Jesus has done, um, but that God was faithful in his life and God will continue to be faithful even in ours. Um, and so that's, that's the further encouragement, you know, um, it would be very simple to say, you know, kind of like the children's song, um, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, um, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Um, verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. It would be very simple to, you know, especially today in what they call this, this cancel culture where, um, if you say the wrong thing or you hold to the unpopular opinion, then there, you're going to find some way, you're going to find yourself canceled in some way, which is to say that you lose your speaking platform or maybe you lose your job or your occupation um, because what you said was unsavory and dis distasteful. And, and your employer or the people who would, who would patronize your business um, now don't all of a sudden because you've been canceled. <laughs> Verse 23 he says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Um, it would be very easy to kind of swerve back and forth. But if you've ever driven on an icy road, um, swerving doesn't get you anywhere except in the ditch, <laughs> right? I've done that, I think, twice. <laughs>
neither of which was very smart or necessary. It wasn't really that bad out, but you start swerving or, you know, 17 years old, 16 years old, coming back from the hardware store and nine o'clock at night and there's fresh snow on the ground. Well, let's just see how much I can fishtail. Um, how much worse it would be for our faith if we kind of fishtail and, and swerve between ideas and instead of having an absolute laser focus on this is what we believe and this is why. And so he says, verse 23, hold with a laser focus because God has promised to be faithful. Uh, verse 24, another statement of law here in the green. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Basically the entire verse. Um, and, and I mean, that's <laughs> all of these. All of these are directly related to, um, to the worship life of, of the Christian church. Whether that's, you know, tuning in, in, in YouTube during a time of coronavirus um, or a more more forward and, and faithful ministration uh, by knocking on the door and saying, hey, where have you been? I really missed you. And part of the function of this, um, spurring one another on toward loving good deeds, verse 24, um, to say that, yes, your life, in your life, God has specifically thought out ideas for you to put your faith into action and for you to demonstrate Christian love to others. He, and that's what we have in, um, what is that, Ephesians 2, Verses 8, 9, and 10. We'll go, we'll go there. Uh, for it is by Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Beautiful statement of, of gospel truth, where he says that our actions are not included in our standing and in even in our faith. Um, and he says, as a result, we are God's workmanship. Um, that God has done the working in us, and he created us for this specific purpose, um, to do good works. And the way that he describes them, good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Um, and or the, the other idea that, you know, prepared in advance for us to do, um, the idea there is for us to, to walk about in, that this is your normal Christian life and your normal Christian walk. And these are the things that you do. And that's the exact idea that we have going on in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Let us can, I'll scroll up just a little bit. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Um, I've, I've ridden a horse, you know, a couple of different horses, but I've, I'm not much of a horse person. We never had horses growing up, but, um, and, and I read a lot of Westerns, watch a lot of John Wayne <laughs> movies growing up. Thanks grandpa. Um, but when a, when a horse gets kicked in the side, or especially if the, the rider happens to be wearing spurs in the movies, um, then the horse jumps and is like, whoa, that was unpleasant. And I should get back to this. Um, and that's, that's the idea here that we spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And sometimes it's unpleasant, um, but that's, that's part of our purpose. And, you know, verse 24, a strong statement of law again, um, that you have a purpose here in this life and it's to demonstrate love for God, you know, give glory to God by demonstrating love for God and love for your neighbor. And, um, and there's, there's really no space for any of us to sit back and say, well, I can't do anything or I don't, you know, I don't really feel like it for the rest of my Christian life. There may be times and seasons when this life has its ups and its downs and busy times and slower times. Um, but the overarching idea is that you've been created for this purpose to demonstrate, to give glory to God by demonstrating love for God and love for neighbor. And sometimes it takes a fellow Christian who can really look you in the eye or take it, walk along alongside you and say, Hey, <laughs> what's going on? Or, um, I think you really have the opportunity and, and the skills to do well at this and you should, or how are things, you know, any number of things. Um, and that, I mean, that's just the nature and character of the Christian congregation that these things drawing near to God also means like drawing near to one another in worship that all these things in green happen in worship. And, and even if it's just YouTube worship right now, um, we need to find a way to help these things in green happen during YouTube worship as well. 
Uh, finally, in verse 25, this is going to finish this out for tonight. Um, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Um, he adds in a little bit of a little bit of peer pressure and a little bit of um, urgency. Um, the peer pressure, well, don't fall into the, the same habits as, as everybody else. Some are in the habit of doing this. You know, you've got your, your summer schedule and you've got your, your winter schedule. Um, there, are, there are times and places for, for things like Solomon even says, there's a time for everything under the sun. And who was that? The, the birds or I don't know. One of those good old oldie songs um, picked up on Ecclesiastes in, in one of their songs. <laughs> Somebody's going to put it in the comments here. Um, but he says, let's not give up meeting together, even if others do. It's the exact same attitude as Joshua in the closing of the book of Joshua after they've conquered most of the land and, and at least established a foothold throughout the land. And Joshua is like, you know, choose for this day who you're going to serve, whether God or the Baals and the other local gods. But, and he says, I can't choose for you, but I can choose for my house. And what we're going to do is we're going to serve the Lord. And that's the exact same thing we have here in verse 25. Let us not give up meeting together. Even if others do, you know, that's on them. Um, we need to, yes, encourage one another, which is the rest of verse 25. But you need to have first this idea of holding unswervingly set in your own mind. Verse 23, hold unswervingly. And what does that look like? And verse 24, spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Verse 25, um, let's continue meeting together even if others don't. Um, and here we are, we're, this is like, you know, 65, 68 AD. Um, it's not, you know, we're pushing 1950 years ago, uh, give or take. Um, this worship attendance thing isn't new. It's not new with the millennials or Gen Xers, or it's not new with YouTube and, and Zoom. It's not new with, um, with a suburban society or a post-war society or increased um, travel and vacations because of affluence and, and vehicles. <laughs> and you could take a road trip. Um, but verse 25 still stands true. In the words of Joshua, in the attitude of Joshua, even if somebody else should make their other choice, as for me, as for my household, this is what we're going to do. And verse 25, the final one, let us encourage one another. And in the idea of um, encourage, and maybe, maybe the application from encourage here, um, the idea is going along alongside somebody and calling them out, or going alongside somebody and speaking to them. Um, and, and I was telling Tom before we got started tonight that I was changing the brake pads and rotors on my car because they, you know, 90,000 miles ago, I did it and it was, it was about time to do it again. And, um, and if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail or a rusted on, um, rusted on brake rotor. If all you have is one tool in your toolbox, then every problem and every issue that you run across is going to need that tool. Um, but the idea here of encouraging one another is coming alongside somebody else and, you know, for different people and as well as different circumstances, they might need a different type of encouragement. Maybe it's the, the listening ear today. And maybe it's a little kick in the butt next week. Maybe it's um, sitting down and, and having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation or, you know, getting together as couples and, and getting some fresh air and saying, hey, there's, there's more to life than the four walls of your home or whatever it happens to be. Um, there's, there's different ways to encourage one another, but that encouragement is in the context of this entire paragraph that the encouragement isn't simply, hey, hang in there, here's a, here's a happy thought and a good Facebook post and, uh, and have a good day. I've been thinking about you and sending happy vibes your way. Um, scripture doesn't talk in that kind of fluff. Scripture talks about, you know, we have a great high priest of the house of God. We have confidence to enter the most holy place, to stand in the, the presence of God himself, that we have confidence to stand unashamed and guilt-free in the throne room of God. <laughs> 
um, that this access to our Lord is, is both new as something that isn't driven by law, but given by gospel, and that this access to the most holy place is living as in an access that will continue um, because Jesus isn't going to die again. He died once and he's not doing it again. He's been raised from the dead and he cannot be, he cannot die again. And so he concludes um, as you encourage one another with whatever tool, whatever form of encouragement that takes today and whatever, you know, whatever the, the words need to be said that are said, um, do it all the more. All the more, you know, this word for all the more that uh, is something that you do more and more because as you see the day approaching, um, nice job in the NIV here, highlighting the fact that we're talking about judgment day. Um, and that's, yeah, that's a scary day. Um, our flesh still trembles in fear of judgment day, but at the same time, that is a joyful day, the day when our salvation is drawing nigh, and we can look ahead to that with joy to say, yes, yes, my Lord is coming soon, and he will set me free from sin and death and pain. And so this encouragement is is urgent, because what if Jesus, I mean, if if you know, God passed you a note, you know, like we used to pass notes in, in grade school. God passed you a note and said, hey, oh, by the way, Judgment Day is going to be um, two days. Let's see, today's Thursday night. I'm going to come Saturday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time or Eastern, whatever, Eastern Time. Um, what would you do? <laughs> what would you do during that intervening day and a half? Um, maybe, hey, you know, I don't need this retirement account anymore. I could cash it out and uh, go skydiving. Um, <laughs> go 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu, you know, I think there's a song in there somewhere. Um, or, or maybe you'd say, Hey, this is the time when I, uh, I don't care how this person reacts. I've been thinking about them for a while and I really need to let them know that Jesus is coming soon. And once eternity begins, there's no second chances and we have access through this new living way. We have confidence to stand before God on that great day. Um, and our confidence is found in Christ alone. That our confidence isn't found in what we do or leave undone. Um, our confidence isn't found in how we feel about it or our guilty conscience. Um, our confidence is found in the facts of the faith, the facts that Jesus has accomplished for our good. And so there's urgency to all of these things that we have highlighted in green. Um, that are based on and built upon the all the other things highlighted in in red and orange um, and blue, mostly. That Jesus has done it all, and He's going to be returning soon. So, because this is the case, let us draw near to God. Let us hold unswervingly. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together and let us encourage one another. And all the more because Jesus is returning soon. I think that wraps us up for tonight. We'll pick it up in verse 26 next time. Um, this chapter, this verse, or this paragraph, verses 19 through 25, one of my most favorite sections in all of scripture, verses 26 and 20, <laughs> verses 26 and following, uh, one of the more terrifying, terrifying sections in all of scripture. And, um, and that's something that deserves a little bit fuller treatment that we will start with next week. Any other questions or comments? And then we'll close with prayer. Okay. Uh, dear Jesus, thank you for giving us confidence to enter into your presence and to stand in your presence with, with no feelings of guilt and no guilt hanging over our heads. Please continue in, to encourage us with the fellowship that we share and to encourage us, us, encourage us with the opportunities that you have placed before us. And we ask you to um, remind us of all that you have done for us and encourage us so that we may speak of your grace today um, and be prepared for your coming, whenever that may be, hopefully soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.